Thank you. It's very good to be here in Korea, and particularly in the center of innovation in Korea, in the Annapolis. And I, I just want to begin by uh, thanking the organizers of this conference, the ICIC, uh, and all the distinguished participants, and in particular, Dr. Young Lok Yoon, who, as he said, translated the book, and without him, uh, none of us uh, would be here listening to the story of Startup Nation, and uh, uh, none of you would have read this book in Korean. Uh, I'm very excited that, that so many of you have read the book and that the book has shown such interest in Korea. As I said to Dr. Yoon, this was an exciting prospect for me from the beginning. Um, I want to talk about the book in terms of three words in the title. The title of the book, of course, is Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle. And the three words are startup, story, and miracle. Now, what do we mean by startups? Israel, of course, has more startups than any country in the world outside the United States in absolute terms. Of course, in per capita terms, Israel has by far the most startups of anywhere in the world. If you look at all of Europe, Europe produces about 600, 700 startups per year, high-tech startups. Israel alone produces about 500. There are about 700 million people in Europe, about 7 million people in Israel. Now, of course, it's not enough to produce startups. The main question with uh, startups is, are they able to get investment? And venture capital investment is the form of investment that goes into startups. And of course, the venture capital funds are looking all over the world for the next big thing, the next Facebook or Microsoft or, or whatever. It has to be something very big, something very successful, very innovative to justify the very high risks that go into venture capital investment. And Israel gets two and a half times as much venture capital per capita as the United States, 30 times as much as Europe. And there are more European venture capital euros invested in Israel than in any single European country. So the venture capital community is clearly voting with its feet, with its dollars, with its euros, uh, that the next big thing will come from Israel. Now, this, of course, all this comes from, in part, another key metric in terms of the success of, of Israel as a startup nation is the level of research and development. Israel you, produces or consumes about 4.5% of its GDP on research and development, which is almost twice the OECD average. And the important thing to understand here about this is that it's not because the government is so smart that it's throwing lots of money at R&D. The capacity of a country to, to spend R&D really comes from the bottom up, from the companies, from the startups, from the large companies that are able to spend that R&D. And if you have the companies that are R&D intensive, you will spend a lot on R&D. Uh, and that's what's happened in Israel. Now, uh, the book, we quickly realized that the, why Israel is so innovative, that the answer has to do with culture. And a culture is best to describe with stories. So we tell, as you know, lots of stories in the book. And just one story I want to tell you uh, it's not about, uh, those are my daughters, actually. Uh, it's not about my daughters. It's, uh, it's about a company, about a, a man named Scott Thompson, who was president, probably still is president, of a company called PayPal. And PayPal was bought by eBay. And the main investor of eBay was a venture capital fund called Benchmark Capital. And Benchmark was in Israel looking for startups like most venture capital funds. And they found a small company called Fraud Sciences, whose job 
was to try to deal with the problem of credit card fraud, people stealing using credit cards. And so Benchmark, the venture capital fund, wanted to know whether to invest in this company or not. And so they asked Scott Thompson, the president of PayPal, who was their expert on this issue, to check out the startup company. So Scott Thompson was meeting with a, a young man from Israel named Svat Shaked, and he asked the young Israeli, what is your big secret for beating credit card fraud? And the young Israeli said, well, I was in the military like most Israelis, and our job was to try to track terrorists and other bad people over the internet. And we had a crazy idea. We thought maybe that terrorists and other bad people don't leave so many traces of themselves on the internet. They don't leave a lot of usernames and passwords and all that kind of stuff because some of they're using fake identities or whatever. And good people, normal people, they leave lots of stuff on the internet, usernames, passwords, all kinds of things without trying, without meaning to, they leave lots of things on the internet. So you look for all that stuff and you've got good people. If you don't find it, you've got bad people and you solve the problem. And right now, Scott Thompson, you know, who's a busy executive of a big company, he's thinking, I can't believe I'm sitting here wasting my time listening to this kid talk to me about terrorists and good people and bad people giving me the story. But he decides, okay, you know, he has to continue with this. And he says, so how did you do with this scheme of yours? And the young Israeli says, well, we've been through 50,000 transactions over the last five years, and we only got 14 wrong. So this is mildly interesting, but not relevant for a company the size of PayPal. So Scott Thompson gets an idea how he's going to get rid of this kid. And he says, okay, I will give you 100,000 transactions that PayPal actually processed so we know how they turned out. And you take this data and you see what you can do. So he thinks, Scott Thompson thinks he's never going to see this Israeli again. It took him five years to process less than half that. So he thinks that's it, goodbye. But Shvat Shaked, the young Israeli, goes back to Israel, and a few days later, Scott Thompson gets a two-word email back. We're done. They'd gone through all the data. They'd sent it back to Scott Thompson, and Thompson gives it to his top 50 PhD engineers in the company. And they're pouring through the data. It takes them a week. By the end, they understand that on the data that PayPal had the most trouble with, Fraud scientists had done 17% better. And this, of course, is a game changer for an industry like this, a major breakthrough. So Scott Thompson goes running to Meg Whitman, who was then head of eBay, and says, we can't let Benchmark invest in this company. We can't let anybody else invest. We have to buy this company. So they make an offer of $80 million, a few days of negotiations, they agree on $186 million. And the next thing you know, Scott Thompson finds himself on an airplane to see the company that he bought. Of course, he never thought about Israel before. He probably never met an Israeli before this. And now he's flying to Israel. And he's waking up on the airplane, and he sees just where he's about to land and the cities around there, and you can see, you know, Beirut, Damascus, Amman, Cairo, and Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv, and he's thinking, I'm flying into a war zone. I bought a company in a war zone. So he has a little panic attack, but he gets over that, and he gets to fraud sciences. And he speaks to the whole company, a group much smaller than this, and he's very impressed. Um, they're, they're listening rapidly. And then he opens it for questions. And he's expecting questions like, you know, you just bought us. How are our two companies going to work together? How is this going to work? No, there weren't any questions like that. It was all questions like, 
Why does PayPal do things this way? Why not that way? Why is PayPal structured this way, not that way? Tough questions about how PayPal is organized and how they do business and their business model. And he's starting to get a little bit nervous up there because these people know what they're talking about. And he's thinking to himself, I thought I bought this company. It's like they bought me. So we call this, uh, Scott Thompson gets the Israel treatment. And you see a lot of aspects here in the story that are typical of Israel. Um, for example, uh, a sort of a, a lack of respect for authority, uh, a desire to challenge and to debate, uh, uh, to ask tough questions, uh, to think creatively, uh, taking a very creative idea in a military context and turn it to a very creative idea in a civilian context, and simply the, the audacity, the, as they say in Hebrew, the chutzpah, uh, that a few small, a small company can recreate an entire industry. This is the idea that startups have. They always think very big. So, the question is, what this means for the nature of innovation. Now, I think that there, uh, when people think about innovation, they tend to think about one thing. For example, if you put the word innovation into Google Images, you look at that, at, at what, how we picture innovation, this is what you'll get. Innovation uh, in, in, in the popular mind is a question of the idea. If you search for the word innovation in pictures, you'll see lots of pictures of light bulbs because the light bulb symbolizes the idea and we think that's what innovation is. But is that really the key to innovation? Is it really the idea? Well, this is a, is a great quote I found from Nicholas Machiavelli from 1513, from hundreds of years ago, talking about the difficulty of innovation. There's nothing more difficult to arrange, more doubtful of success, more dangerous to carry through than initiating change. The innovator makes enemy, enemies of all those who prosper under the old order and gains only lukewarm support from those who would prosper under the new. And it, this captures how difficult innovation is. And what we actually discovered in, in writing about Israel and learning about Israel that, that the idea is actually maybe the least important of three components. The other two are the willingness, it is, is a tremendous amount of drive, of determination, of chutzpah, or whatever you want to call it, of mission orientation. And the third element is willingness to take risks. Because those of you who have tried to innovate know that if you have a new idea, the first thing that will happen, particularly for a startup, the first thing that will happen is everyone will tell you it's, it's not a good idea because new ideas never sound like good ideas when you, when you first hear them. They sound like crazy ideas. So most people will say that's not a good idea. And the second thing that will happen if you're trying to do a startup is people will tell you, don't do it, it's too risky. Most startups fail, and they're certainly right about that. So you have to have a lot of determination, a lot of drive, a lot of willingness to take risks, to take an idea, and turn it into a startup or a product or a company. And if another indication that it's not just the idea is that if you think about the number of patents in the world, Israel has, is very high up in the number of patents per capita, but so is Korea, so are other countries, produce lots and lots of patents. That means that they have lots of ideas. But if you compare Israel to these other countries, they aren't producing nearly as many startups. So evidently, it's not just the idea that determines whether there will be innovation or startups. So the question is, once you say that it takes an, 